Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, your host for Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. I've got an awesome duo on the show today. We're going to be talking about this amazing cookbook. It's called To Wow, and it's on progressive indigenous cuisine. Let me tell you a little bit about um, our two guests. First, it's Shane Chartrand. He's of the Enoch Cree Nation in Canada and sits at the forefront of the reemergence of indigenous cuisine in North America. He was raised in central Alberta, where he learned to respect food through raising livestock, hunting, and fishing on his family's acreage. Chartrand relocated to Edmonton as a young man to pursue culinary training. And in 2015, he was invited to participate in the prestigious international chef contingent of Cook It Raw, which is a yearly gathering of top chefs, and has since competed on the Food Network Canada's Iron Chef Canada and Chopped Canada. Currently, he is the executive chef at the acclaimed SC restaurant at the River Cree Resort and casino in Enoch, Alberta, where he transforms his diverse influences and experiences into culinary art. And we also have Jennifer Cockrell King, who's a Canadian food writer, and she now lives in the small community of Naramata in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley. She's the author of Food in the City, Urban Agriculture, and the New Food Revolution, and Food Artisans of Okanagan Valley. Her writing has appeared in publications across North America, and I'm just so excited to have you both on the show, and congratulations on a really beautiful book. Thank you. Yeah. So why- Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's very, that's a very nice compliment. Thanks. I mean, I think some of the things that really caught my attention as I went through the book was, number one, the photography is gorgeous. I love oh, yeah. how you you sh- show these ingredients and really emphasize seasonality in the book. Um, and the recipes look pretty amazing also to try. So maybe we can start, Shane, just by having you give us a little bit of background um, on how you came into the field of, of being a chef and especially a chef with focus on indigenous cuisine. Well, that's an that's an interesting question. This comes up all the time. So, um, becoming a chef is not something I ever wanted to do. It was never something that I dreamt of doing. What what happened when when was when I was a kid? I um, wanted a pair of shoes. Okay, so I went to my parents. I was uh, 16 years old. I wanted this pair of really expensive shoes, or like I don't know, Reeboks or Air Jordans or something. So my mom said to me, uh, you know what, if you want those, go get a job, buy them yourself. We can't afford it. We got other kids that we got to take care of. You're, you know, we're not just going to buy you a $300 pair of shoes. So um, I took her advice and then I went to, I took my uh, mountain bike and I rode to the, I rode down to a place called, it's called Gasoline Alley. Because I, I grew up in a farm out of Red Deer. And so the closest thing that I could find where I could get a job is either a gas station or a restaurant. So I picked a restaurant. And then I was a dishwasher, and then I watched all the kids who were only about a year older than me. They're all cooking with all the equipment, flat tops, grills, you know, bain marie's, stuff like this, that I was just like, man, I think I can do the same thing. I think I can do that. And it looks fun. And they all had fun. And we're talking about a time where it's not – a, ch- a chit system like a romenco or squirrel romenco i can't believe i just said that where squirrel systems where it comes out on uh, like out of computer if they're handwritten bills that were on a wheel yeah that's how long ago i started cooking and yeah i just it just started there and i just felt like i love art i've always loved art and what i really wanted to be was a carpenter but when i started cooking i'm like no 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 this can be art so that's where it started that's awesome. That's really cool. And, you know, you focus a lot on wild foods in your book. And tell us a little bit about your, your experience with hunting and fishing and your connection to the wild. Well, I've been hunting since I was a kid. Um, actually, Jen, too. She's, I think Jen has been hunting more than me in the past five years, strangely. 
That's uh, I shouldn't I shouldn't say strangely, but I've been watching her stuff too. And Jen, Jen, she looks like she's having fun out there too. I do a lot more fishing than I do hunting, but um, I it's always something with, that we've been we've been taught to do. I mean, I've got a I don't know about five rifles. I don't I don't do uh, goose hunting anymore, but I do certainly like hunting birds and I love fishing. But it's always just been something where my you got to realize like my family didn't have a whole lot of money. And um, so hunting was sort of just the way we're taught to live, you yeah. know, and, and then furthermore, furthermore, this is something else. We're ethical hunters, which means if I shoot one moose, I shoot only one moose. If I see another one, I don't need to shoot that one because I'm only I'm only um, shooting this for the meat for my family. Yeah. So I don't need to, I, you know, so this is the way I was raised and this is the way my dad taught me. And it's funny because my dad will fully admit, and because we used to raise chickens and geese and all that kind of stuff too, and we used to kill them and have to pluck them and everything. But my dad's funny because he's got a, he's kind of, he's, you know, he, he's not mean or anything like that, but he's, he's a hunter. But he's got a, this soft spot, which I've just recently found out the reason why that I had to be the guy to, to kill all the chickens and geese is because he didn't want to do it because he didn't it was sad <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> i i had a similar a, a you know experience in childhood with hunting with my with my dad and we would always get stuck you know cleaning the birds not because i think he was sad in his case it was more like it was just like really kind of you know a lot of work <laughs> to pluck well, all the feathers. <laughs> well, and I, and that's the that's the thing. That's why me and Jen have became such good friends. Like like Jen said this many times that we've done we've done so many of these interviews. Um, Jen knows we've always been around each other, but like Jen's like legitimately at this particular moment, one of my very 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 best friends. And this book says everything about it because she had to deal with being patient around me and I'm not an unpatient un guy I just don't always have direction so imagine trying to write a book like imagine being in Jen's position as a writer okay I'm not saying anything I'm not I'm not doing any I'm just cooking and Jen's got to race around and try to get the ingredients and ask me all these questions that I don't want to answer and then we went on a book tour a bunch of different cities some cities actually I, I really enjoyed that i never thought i would it was actually quite a it was quite a trip so we have been through we have been through a lot together and it was it's surprising i think when it comes to this book how well it came across because i didn't i didn't believe it was going to come true but jen made it come true so i may i may be a big part of that book and it's my name and all that kind of stuff but I still say it's Jen's name as much as it is mine. Great. Jen, tell us a bit, how did you get into food writing and, and when did you start hunting? Well, so Shane and I both grew up in central Alberta. Um, he was, you know, Calgary and then Red Deer. I was Edmonton. It's all sort of the same geography, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up, I don't have Indigenous roots. I'm part of non-Indigenous Canada, you know. And uh, so there was quite a separation um, in those days. It's, it's nice to see some coming together of, um, of, our, of our family here in Canada, which um, part of this book celebrates as well. But um, I, I grew up, you know, my parents, my dad was a hunter and his dad was a hunter. And so we would be out at the cabin and, and there would be sort of that going on. Um, but we really got away from it because we were basically in the city most of the time. So just, you know, big memories and whatnot. But I got into food writing because my parents loved food. Um, they were gardeners. Uh, we just ate as a family, we cooked as a family. So food is really integral to who I am and how I see the world. And that's mm. where Jane and I connect is we both see the world through the lens of food and we know that there's um, friendship and healing and um, fun. And I mean, everything 
food is everything. Um, every emotion you can come mm. up with, we can express it through food. But we didn't know one another. We were both part of the food landscape in Edmonton. I as a professional writer and Shane is this chef who was doing interesting things. And then finally, at some point, um, Shane expressed a wish to write a cookbook. And he was on this journey of discovering um, his indigenous roots as a Cree man, um, professional chef, but, you know, grew up adopted in a Métis family and then, and then found out he was from the Enoch Cree nation and his imagination started to, to run wild, which was amazing. And I had never written a cookbook, but I'd written books on food and I knew I could help him at least get to the stage where we could get a really good proposal. I really believed in what he was doing. And then we just kept working together. I mean, books take forever. It took us four and a half, five years to put this book together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he was very patient with me, trust me. Um, and as we worked together more and more, we just had more and more in common and we goof around and we're such good friends. And then we realized this was a really important message was that everybody, everybody who picks up this book can celebrate the beauty of indigenous cultures in Canada. And Shane is just one person doing some amazing food. Um, and it's just part of the conversation that's really happening in Canada right now. That's awesome. Well, some of the things I was really drawn to in, in the book were you know, well, there are a lot of things I was drawn to, but I'll start with this first one is, is your use of wild fruit. And maybe we could start with Saskatoon berries. How, where do you find Saskatoon berries, Shane? Do you, do you work with? Yeah, well, you can find them everywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So like, no, no, but the thing about that. So what Jen said, which is kind of funny, we had this guy, Alessandro Porcelli come to Canada I think he's, he li I, Jen, I think he lives in Mexico, does he not? He was living in Merida. He actually was connected with Rene Redzepi through Noma um, in Copenhagen. And now he's yeah, I remember that. somewhere in Eastern Europe. But yeah, I so the, to yeah, sorry to tell yeah. him afterwards. <laughs> well, no, they, they came here. They've never had a Saskatoon berry in their life, mm -hmm. you know? It's crazy to me to think, I mean, it's got that uh, vanilla marzipan sweetness i mean saskatoons are insanely delicious yeah um you know i got a bag in my fridge and i'm not trying to be that guy to say i have i always have saskatoon berries in my refrigerator because <laughs> i don't okay i'm being honest it was a gift from a native guy yeah. um but i love saskatoons um i don't even need to cook them down i mean that's the thing about berries like me and Jen could go for a walk together, have a bag of Saskatoons, and just eat them straight up. Mm -hmm. They taste delicious. They're they're incredible. So they grow on um, they grow on bushes pretty much across Canada, um, in the prairies to the west coast and way up into the Yukon. So they're a very common. Oh yeah, Yukon. Yeah. Yeah, they're a very common sort of small bush, willowy, you know, willowy branch berry everywhere. And right now I'm sitting in my office in the Okanagan. I've got a plastic owl on a, on a, on a post that is trying to protect my Saskatoon cultivar that I brought from Africa <laughs> against the robins because it is a battle royale every June. So there are Saskatoons in the Okanagan as well. Um, they're one of the four food chiefs out here in the Okanagan Valley with the, um, on the territory here, um, the interior Salish silks people. And anyways, the, the robins don't want the local Saskatoons because Northern Alberta does have the best Saskatoon berries. So I have to mm. drape this tree in three versions of nets and um, I, <laughs> might get, I might get a few um, berries out of it, but right now it's it's looking grim. Oh no. Yeah. Anyways, they're, they're like a blueberry. So they're, they're the, they're the size of a small blueberry. Um, and they grow in kind of grape like clusters and they're ripe around mid June here. I'm further South. And then where Shane is sort of into July and they do, they have a blueberry type flavor cause they're dark purple, but they have an almond marzipan uh, interesting flavor profile 
and uh, you can, it's, you know, it's one of the key ingredients traditionally of pemmican, so dried berries, dried meat, fat, um, yeah. but yeah. nowadays it's Saskatoon pie and just fresh Saskatoons and Saskatoon shortcake and Saskatoon syrup on your pancakes and it's delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh my gosh. We have a related species here in Georgia. We call it service berry. Um, it's actually the same. It's just yeah. a different. Sure, what the hell is a service berry? <laughs> so it's it's just a different species. Yeah, they're all in this genus. Huh. Here. Yeah, don't get me started on botany. I totally geek out. <laughs> no, no, I don't have. I have no clue. I've never well, heard. Jen, it, I can already tell. Jen, Jen already knows. I know. I've never heard of that in my life. Alnifolnia is the mm -hmm. genus, right? And yeah, um, but then we have the the variation. So yeah, uh, and service berry is also called shad bush berry, June berry. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It goes by different common names. Yeah, like, no, no, no. Now I know. And yeah. they're actually rose relatives, which is so fabulous because they look like what would be a blueberry relative in some ways, but they're actually more closely related to wild roses. Yes. Uh, yeah. Huh. And the term Saskatoon that we use is actually from the Cree word. Um, so the town of Saskatoon in Saskatchewan is named after the anglicized, I guess, version of the the Cree word for Saskatoon, which oh, cool. I won't I won't butcher. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Well, you mentioned something just a moment ago about how you use the Saskatoon and something called pemmican. Now, I can tell you, most people in the States have no idea what pemmican is. Can you tell us what that is and how is it made? What ingredients go into it? Jen, you want to answer? Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, it's the original power bar of the prairies, right? Like, it's, um, it's a food that has been made... Um, for millennia and millennia, um, dried pounded meat, so buffalo or you know bison meat, um, when it's harvested and dr dressed and you know dried out, and then you can pound it into a powder um, at a certain point, and um, then the Saskatoon berries can be added to that um, when they're dried out a little bit, and then the fat. Um, is added as a preservative, almost like a confit. So it's a really sophisticated but super efficient food source um, that is high in calories and nutrition, um, but really preserves well. Now, not many people I know, and maybe Shane, we don't know a lot of people who regularly eat pemmican. It's sort of a... <laughs> no, no. Because you know, the, the, the fat can go a bit rancid. Um, but we have a recipe in the cookbook for salmon pemmican, which is an unusual twist on it that Shane came up with. Um, so it's just, it's an interesting link to the past in the foodways here in Canada. Um, but it's not something that you're going to find a lot of, but People in Canada do know what pemmican is because we've all sort of tried it at one point with varying um, degrees of success. Yeah, and the idea of the salmon pemmican is because one thing that I have to do is um, I've made pemmican many, many times. Matter of fact, um, I've made it so much with events that people ask me, Shane, Shane, do pemmican, do pemmican. I'm like, oh, I'm sick of making pemmican. <laughs> like, it doesn't taste good, guys. So everyone's, everybody's food, I do a collaboration. Okay, so this is how it works. We do collaborations with, let's say, six chefs. I go to Calgary, we do an event, and then, you know, the guy that's putting it up, that's doing the organization, organizing the whole thing, he wants me to do pemmican. I'm like, well, everyone gets to do delicious stuff, and I get it, I get it to do something that tastes terrible. <laughs> But I have to explain, thankfully, I always ask, let me explain, please. Don't let me just make pemmican without, without a story because you guys are going to eat it and be like, Chef Shane's a terrible chef. This is terrible. That's so bad. <laughs> no, you can dress it up. You can, you know, we could add sugar and we can, we can make it, we could make it into something that could taste really delicious, but that's not real pemmican. So, 
you know, I, I don't want to screw around with history, you know, and it's one thing to, to have a twist. That's okay. I know many friends that have uh, pemmican on their menus, but they, they put twist in it and everything. And then people, people think that is what pemmican is. So in that recipe, yes, you know, we had to be very ethical in how we decided to make that choice. Do we put pemmican in the menu or, or, or in the cookbook or not? I don't know. I, even I was unsure, um, but Jen convinced me, and it, it makes sense because it's very, very, it's it's one of the oldest indigenous, uh, well, it's not really a recipe. We made our own, but still, you get what I'm saying? Like, I mean, we still yeah. have to celebrate it. And then the salmon twist was my idea just because, I don't know, I just thought you could probably make pemmican out of anything dried, really. Cool. If it was Arctic char, probably too. Yeah, and it was it was made in the past really because it could store a long time, right? It was, it was like a mechanism of food security to to make food. Well, food. yeah, that's what Jen was saying exactly. You can go from you can go from nation to nation to nation. And by the way, there actually is a trail. I got to look this up though. I I still got to look this up. There's a trail of indigenous people who've gone all across Canada and back, and there is a trail. Um. And pemmican was what they ate, just, uh, you know, gives them protein, gives them fat. Um, it gives them everything they need, right? That's mm. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. one, one recipe I really wanted to touch on was your signature recipe, Shane. And this is the one you have a, actually <laughs> an image of it on the cover. And it's just beautiful. And you call it war paint. How did you come up with this recipe? Uh, war paint's been something I've always wanted to try to, I, I, so, um, the one thing about me is I like, Jen, you're going to laugh because I've heard, you've heard me say this so many times. Oh my God. Um, I like pretty and I like mean. <laughs> okay. So I love tattoos. I'm covered in tattoos. I also like flowers. If a girl gave me flowers, which only happened once in my life. Um, that makes me happy. <laughs> I love flowers. That's why I got a daylily on my hand. So if you look, well, granted, you didn't see my tattoos. I'm, I love octopus, which is strange. I love uh, daylilies. That's my favorite flower. So you understand? Yeah. So uh, war paint was my friend Wes Studi. So if you ever watched the movie uh, Dances with Wolves, he's the, the villain that's got the, the, the hand print on his face, war paint on his face. Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the villain in, in Dances with Wolves. And um, I always liked that. I, I like the hand print. So Wes Studi is a really close friend of mine now. Like we're, we're I mean, I just hung up with the guy a week ago. Oh, cool. So my world... You know, I can hang with farmers. I can hang with people from LA, and oh, it's crazy. But that whole war paint thing was the idea of something that I thought was ruthless, powerful, mean, and pretty. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's so I, I don't know. I don't know. I just thought war paint uh, was a great name for it because that's what it was. It's war paint. Indigenous people are going to war. They, they put war paint on because, and war paint actually is because they're trying to intimidate. They're trying to scare you. You know, the Blackfoot tribe, the, the Kainai nation, the Pakani nation, the Cree, the Métis, we're all trying to scare each other. So <laughs> war paint is something that's meant to scare you. Um, so I just felt it was uh, an appropriate name if that makes sense. Yeah, but then this beautiful dish. So I don't want to scare people off of the, di the dish. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You're right, dish. Jen. Yeah, I don't yeah. mean it like that. Can you but, the dish for us? What does it look like? What are the what are the future ingredients? Um, what do we have there? Deep fried horseradish, red fife wheat berry ragu, mushrooms. Uh, and it's all local stuff, all from local farmers. And I'm not trying to push on the whole hyper local stuff i'm just saying it was mm -hmm. there's a time and a place for that kind of stuff but i just felt with my book it was really or our book sorry jen i felt it was interesting for us to express local farmers 
and uh, red pipe wheatberry. Man, oh man, that stuff's hard to cook. It, you have to soak that for <laughs> days. Like I think, well, a day would be fine, but then I had to pressure cook that, which you don't need to do. But I mean, if you get, if you could soak it for one more day, then you don't need to pressure cook it. But I did. But anyway, I'm I'm a huge pressure cooker kind of guy. So, yeah. So I mean, that's the that was the deal, and that was a red pepper maple syrup sauce that made the handprint. Yeah. What else? What else did I miss, Jen? So it's a very striking dish. Um, it's uh, a white plate because it looks best on white with Shane's actual hand. He makes a, a red pepper maple syrup um, reduction, uses his hand to put the handprint on the plate and then he places the other elements on top of that. So like he said, there's um, a leg of quail, there's some red pipe wheat berries. Which oh yeah, the quail, that's well, that's right. Uh, to the prairies some deep fried horseradish strips, uh, a little piece of grilled zucchini, so the squash that's, you know, from from North America. Anyway, it, it's an L, there's a lot of elements on this dish that are both traditional, modern. Um, it's got this badass sort of look to it because it has that red hand print and it's just visually striking. Like it's just a beautiful image. Yeah. Makes people want to look at this food. It draws your attention. And you think, well, what's up with that? And it is. It's got this beauty and this ferocity to it. And it's just so full of image that we knew right away that was going to be the cover of the cookbook. That's awesome. Oh, well, and, and, and there's, another th there's another side to that, too. We, uh, Jen, if I'm not mistaken, we had two other choices for the cover, right? Yes, yeah. There was a bone marrow. Right, yeah. And then uh, the name of the book actually was not going to be Toal. I picked something else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, I mean, so this is, this is where you have to respect the people around you. So I'm, because I'm Indigenous, you have to understand I'm Cree. And I know a lot about Cree. Okay, I don't know everything about Cree, but I know a lot about, I, I know a lot more than I say. I'm very humble when it comes to that kind of stuff. Now, imagine... Uh, the, the original idea, my choice was marrow. I wanted the, the book to be called Marrow. And um, the publishing team called Jen, I think, first and said, well, I, I, we don't really like the name because people are going to assume the book's about bone marrow. And... I told Jan right from the start, I said, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. No one's going to tell me. I don't need anyone to tell me about my culture or about what I'm going to do. But at the end of the day, um, it's true. Wow. Jan, you have to explain her. I don't remember how they saw that word, but right. I do know they saw that word somewhere. And wow is a very, very strong, powerful word. Mm -hmm. And I, I never really thought about that concept. So, you know, in the, in the spirit of somebody who does what they do um, as a profession, I took their advice and Tuau happened. We're the Tuau army, spreading, yep. spreading the love of progressive indigenous cooking. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, I wanted to, as we kind of get close to wrapping up, I wonder if, if you could both comment a bit on the theme of seasonality that you include in the book, because you, you separate the recipes by the seasons and how, how is cooking in the seasons linked to the overall kind of vision of, of your, of your cuisine? <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you this right now. That wasn't my idea. But that was, Jen, idea. that was Jen's idea. <laughs> so no 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 but, but but just bear with me here okay so all i was doing was thinking 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 dreaming 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 thinking now jen came up with the idea of seasons so then i'm like that's a wicked idea so then we had to make the recipes and separate them to the seasons so squash when is squash that's fall you know when is uh fresh herbs that's spring <clears throat> and I never really thought about that. So that's why our friendship and to make this book what it is, is what it is because 
yes, I'm the indigenous guy. Yes, I can talk about powwow. Yes, I can talk about sweat. Yes, I can talk about peace pipe. Actually, no, pipe. It's not called peace pipe. It's called pipe. Um, yes, I can talk about uh, indigenous words and culture and the stuff I've seen, the teepees I've been in, the, you know, the lodges I've been in. <clears throat> um, but it wasn't, it, that was not actually my idea. But again, going back to the, going back to know somebody knows better than me. And Jen is the one that put up the seasons and she, it, it makes sense because then what, what, what makes it cool is the fact that we can now allocate and um, put recipes in a space that makes sense versus just random recipes. So I thought it was genius. And that's all Jen, by the way. And, and I'm not trying to pump Jen up here for a second. I just do because it, it, uh, this is the so truth. He's so we, we know we speak the truth. The idea is truth and reconciliation. And the truth is the truth. And that is the truth. So when she brought that idea up, I was like, wow, that makes even more sense because now I can go back in time and we can go back in the history and look at things and talk about the fall, talk about the winter. You also got to realize that book is me and Jen's life. So that means if it's not just about the recipes, it's about her stories. It's about my life as a 60 scoop survivor in foster care or, you know, going through restaurants that sucked and, you know, I've worked in restaurants since I was like, like I told you, 16 years old, you know, it's my life. It'll be my life. I hope I hopefully forever. Um, but you know, the thing is, that's what the book is supposed to uh, showcase. Mm. It's just not, it's not Shane Chartrand. It's Jen and me. It's a Munyao with a native guy that literally have gotten together and made something awesome. And furthermore, the coolest thing about it is two colors, two people, two moms. We don't come from the same mom. Mm -hmm. But the but the earth is our mom. And Jen knows this. Yeah. That's great. Well, and, and just being where we live, I mean, um, it's weather is the reality in in our mm. northern latitudes, right? Like um it's a very kind of Canadian thing to talk about the weather incessantly because it rules our life. The cold, the heat, the spring, the fall. Mm. And there's a rhythm. And I think, you know, the, the rhythm has always been front and center in people who live on the land and from the land, from whatever culture you're from. And so just being a gardener, I. It, it actually didn't occur to me that this was a revolutionary idea. This just made all the sense in the world that we had to separate that. And then we had these like seasons, the seasonality of, of cooking, because I don't know why, I don't know why that that's not a thing because for me as a gardener, true enough, true enough. And for Shane as a hunter and fisherman, like you don't just go and get Saskatoon berries in February it just doesn't happen. So yeah. they have to be of the place, of the land, and respect the rhythm. We have a friend in the in the cookbook, Cowboy Smith, who's very eloquent, and he talks about the frequencies of the land. And if you tune into those frequencies, so much becomes just so so clear and so obvious. And um, and mm -hmm. so I was just grateful. I was grateful to have a voice in this cookbook. And I was also grateful to be allowed to come on this journey because it's such an extraordinary place where Shane and I live with these extraordinary expressions of art and love and food and culture. And um, I don't know, I just, I eat it all up. <laughs> That's great. That's great. One, well, Shane, what are, what are, where do you see the future of indigenous foods going in Canada? I've, I've spoken before with chef Sean Sherman in the U S he's Lakota. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. He's doing such fascinating work with, you know, with local communities and seeing how to recapture this knowledge and, and bring it back out. Is, is that also one of your hopes to, to bring more attention to indigenous cuisine and, get get younger children excited about this 
Um, I'm going to say yes and no. Okay. Um, Sean Sherman is a good friend. I like what he does. Uh, his sous chef is really good too. Uh, Sean Sherman's book is really nice. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, um, the, this is the problem. So Sean Sherman, like, like indigenous people are very, very quiet, right? Mm -hmm. Very quiet. They don't want to speak too loud. And I've been called out on this very many, a, a lot of times because I've done so many TV shows that this guy, this elder of mine came to me from my own nation, you know, from the Skosik tribe and said, you're too loud. You're too loud. And I said, I'm not loud enough. And neither are you. I said that to my elder. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a no-no. You don't, <laughs> you don't speak back to your grand, you don't speak back yeah. to your grandmother. Right. She's the, she's the knowledge keeper. Right. But mm -hmm. you know, I got my own my own take of what I believe in. And the only reason I've gotten to where I'm at is because sometimes they do fight. So does Jen. So I think um, that I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm this hyper indigenous guy that spends my entire life thinking about indigenous food. All the, I don't. Okay, so if I shoot a moose, I shoot a deer, does that make me indigenous? Is that is that make me what happens if you if you went shooting, if you had a rifle and you went hunting and you shot a deer, does that make you indigenous? Yeah, no. I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, it's 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 the it's the culture, it's a lifestyle. So mm -hmm. I think the idea of everything in the end of the day, what I've ever wanted from this book, and when I started, it's not just about me being indigenous, it's about me being me. So like I said, if you open that book, you'll know me in, you know, 15 pages. <laughs> you won't know, know me, but I mean, you'll, you'll, yeah. you'll have a pretty good clue. And that's where Jen came around. <clears throat> that's where the stories. And, and, and so in the indigenous culture, stories is what we all believe in. That's our world is stories. That's why we can watch certain things or when you have to, do, you know, do a, a pipe ceremony, you can't speak. So what they give you is it's something called um, talking stick. So you can't speak unless you have the talking stick. Other than that, you don't say a word. Mm. If, you, if you say a word, you're out. You know, so to you have to understand, we have to respect each other's about. words. Hence, this conversation. Jen spoke, you spoke, I spoke, Jen spoke. That's talking stick even though we're not holding one. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, that's the idea, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. that's the idea of listening. Mm -hmm. Listening is like Cowboy Smith is a very close friend. He's a good, he's a good dude. He's a good man. Lori Buffalo is in the book as well. And I, I don't know why we keep overlooking Lori Buffalo. Lori Buffalo right. is the strongest female indigenous woman I know. Lori Buffalo. Mm -hmm. You can't mess with a girl like that. She's not only strong, she's <laughs> resilient. She's been through everything and she's smart. She's educated. She's gone to university and that's why she's in the book. And she, Lori Buffalo um, is from Muscochis and Muscochis is one of the most dangerous indigenous bands here in Alberta. And it still is. I mean, when I was a kid, you got to think about, think about this. There was people dying from gang violence every weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's only, I don't know, 45 minutes away from my hometown. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's where she grew up. And Lori Buffalo is massively successful. Yeah. So Cowboy Smith, Lori Buffalo, you know, um, Jen Cockrell King, you know, just because Jen hasn't been through that kind of stuff, which no one needs to see. Uh, it doesn't mean that Jen hasn't been through her world of hurt and pain. And, and, and matter of fact, you yourself, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, just cause you're interviewing us doesn't mean you've not been through your hurt and pain. Yeah. So that's the, the book is not, is not just a cookbook. It's a life story. It's supposed to make people feel good and think it's the idea. That's awesome. That's great. Well, and so well said, and um, a, not just beautiful writing of stories and recipes, but also beautiful images and 
looks like some delicious yeah. recipes. So um, mm. I'm, I look forward to trying to cook some of these myself. And um, if I'm ever up in Edmonton, where do we, where do we go to taste your food? Um, what's the name of your restaurant? Well, <laughs> now we're talking about something tricky here. So okay. I actually don't work in a restaurant anymore. Okay. But I do represent the River Cree Resort and Casino. Cool. So that's okay. on the West End. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, well, so I mean, well, there's no, I do, indi I do indigenous food for events, not nice. in my restaurant. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I got to be honest because yeah. I don't want to no, expect that's great. people to show up and think they're yeah. going to get some indigenous. I just do them on my events. So when I go to the Okanagan or hang out with Jen or whoever else, that is when I do my indigenous dinners is in events. So that's when I'm going to do crazy cool things. And yeah, I, and I trust me, I push myself hard. Like I, I push myself to the point where sometimes I make myself really pissed off and ask Jen, like I made recipes that I was mad at myself. They didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. And then Jen, it, it's here. Sorry. I'm veering off track. I apologize. Jen would say, no, this isn't for the book. This is for the book. And then think about this. Jen, you got you got to chime on this one. Who decided War Paint was going to be the cover? Did you? Well, I, I remember thinking this has just got to be it. Like, I have these feelings, just like you have feelings, and I have these instincts. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I see it. I see the book cover, and it's got War Paint on the cover. And so the publisher, we put that forward as an idea. We tried out a couple of different other things, and it was just so obvious to everybody who looked at it that that was the cover. But yeah, so so Shane's food um, is beyond his restaurant, which I actually love. Uh, you mm -hmm. can experience it through the cookbook. You can experience it through his Instagram chats. You can experience it through <laughs> everything, his events. Um, and it really is, yeah, it really is his take on his personal journey. Um, it's not meant to speak for anybody else. And that, I think, was the moment we knew we could just go fully at a full gallop with his creativity and vision, because it wasn't about anything other than just telling his story and, and being spontaneous in the way that Shane is to the best of our ability. So... Um, and I think that's why people have kind of <clears throat> welcomed the book into their world because it's not an encyclopedia. We're not experts on Indigenous cuisine. Oh, yeah, good call. Right? We are just two people. Um, Interesting. Shane's got the creativity and it's his story. And I just bring my little nudges, you know, as he's been talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's way beyond. <laughs> And then we worked hard and we created this thing that we're both proud of. So that's great. Well, congratulations to you both. This has really been um, a fascinating book. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the show and, and sharing this experience with the foodie pharmacology audience. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Cassandra. Great. Yeah, Miao Kisika. Hi, hi, my friend. <sighs> I'm Cassandra Quave, and you've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded on Zoom from home during the COVID-19 isolation period. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or any major podcast streaming services. You can find the book, To Wow, discussed on this episode with any major bookseller. Um, we've got an awesome lineup of topics and shows for you this season, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.